So we're the Electronic Frontier Foundation, an uh, organization founded in 1990. We have been working on defending uh, civil liberties in an online world. Uh, started out by uh, uh, helping out in a uh, Steve Jackson Games, uh, was our first client. Uh, they had been raided by the Secret Service because someone had put some information concerning E911 on their BBS. Secret Service seized all of their computers, uh, which included the computers they needed to produce their games. Uh, that made them very upset and unable to do business. EFF came in uh, and got them their computers back and have been uh, trying to help out uh, defending uh, civil liberties online since. Our main issues... Oh, thank you. Uh, privacy, free speech, uh, innovation and fair use, coders' rights, uh, transparency in government, um, and uh, our distinguished panel uh, will be uh, saying a few words about our, uh, our work, uh, and then the structure will be to uh, turn it over to you, uh, the audience, to ask questions of the panel. Uh, but uh, a few cautionary words before we get into the questions and answers. One is that this is not the appropriate forum for uh, asking for legal advice for yourself. If you have confidential information, please don't put it into your question. Uh, we should, uh, if you want to convey confidential information to us, we should do that privately. Um, if, uh, if we are unable to provide uh, uh, legal assistance, to you. We have a network of cooperating attorneys that work with a lot of people, so uh, if you come to us for help, we'll do our best to either help you ourselves or find someone to help you with your legal problem, uh, but that's something best taken uh, offline. We've had a, a tradition for the, uh, the last couple of years. We had a coder's rights project, which uh, we kicked off last year. Uh, and we've continued this year and plan to continue next year. So for, uh, for people who are presenting uh, at uh, Black Hat and DEF CON and have some questions about the legal issues arising from their uh, presentations, if they're disclosing a vulnerability, if they're disclosing something about what they did in order to find that vulnerability, uh, that they're wondering what the uh, legal situation surrounding is. Uh, we're, we're, we encourage people to get in touch with us uh, before uh, uh, next year's Black Hats and, and, and DEF CON to ask those questions. So let me uh, uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, the, the panel here, and then I will turn it over to them to uh, give some more detail about what we're doing. Uh, to my left, Kevin Bankston, a senior staff attorney. This is Marsha Hoffman, a staff attorney at EFF. Jennifer Granick, our civil liberties director. Thank you. And Fred Von Lohman, a senior staff attorney. Now I'll start off with Kevin. Thanks, Kurt. Hi, I uh, mostly work the government surveillance beat at EFF, and it's been an interesting year of highs and lows uh, in that area. As some of you may recall, back in January 2006, uh, we sued uh, AT&T for illegally opening up its network and its databases to the NSA. Thank you. Um, we were pretty excited about that case, too, uh, but there have been a few wrinkles since then. Uh, last summer, despite our best lobbying efforts and the efforts of a lot of you working as activists, uh, Congress passed an immunity for the phone companies that have assisted the NSA, uh, creating this rather scary procedure where if the Attorney General files a secret piece of paper with the court that says, they didn't do it, I think it was legal, or the President told them it was okay, the cases had to be dismissed. Uh, and we, uh, two things happened after that. First, uh, after the Attorney General did file his secret certification, we challenged the statute as unconstitutional. Uh, we thought that violated our plaintiff's due process rights, violated the separation of powers, and basically turned the Attorney General into judge and jury, uh, usurping the court's role to decide what the law is. Uh, we also filed a new lawsuit called Jewel v. NSA, uh, challenging the government directly, the NSA, the DOJ, other government offices and, and off, uh, officers, uh, and some individuals in their personal capacity, including uh, Dick Cheney and Alberto Gonzalez. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, our challenge to the constitutionality of the immunity uh, didn't go that great. Uh, earlier this summer, uh, Judge Walker in San Francisco, despite some apparent misgivings about this unprecedented immunity, uh, held that it was constitutional. 
um, which was a great disappointment to us. We are going to be appealing that decision to the Ninth Circuit. In the meantime, however, we're moving full speed ahead on the Jewel v. NSA case. And just uh, two weeks ago, uh, we argued in court against the government's motion to dismiss that case, uh, where the government has been arguing uh, that the NSA program is still such a secret that to litigate its legality at all would harm national security. Uh, and also pushing the rather aggressive theory that no one can ever sue the government ever for damages or for an injunction for violating federal surveillance statutes. Um, we're waiting for a decision uh, on that motion right now, um, and we'll certainly uh, update you guys when that happens. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we've been working on some other issues, trying to protect the privacy of your email and the privacy of your cell phone's location. Uh, last time I was here a couple years ago, I told you about a case called Warshock v. US. Uh, Steve Warshock was the CEO of Berkeley Nutraceuticals. You may be familiar with their mail enhancement product, Insight. Uh, <laughs> Well, Mr. Warshock was being investigated and was eventually prosecuted for a, a variety of flavors of fraud. And as a part of that investigation, the government used a law called the uh, Stored Communications Act to get his emails without a warrant, something that we think the Fourth Amendment doesn't allow. Uh, we briefed the Sixth Circuit on that issue as friends of the court, and citing our arguments, the Sixth Circuit a couple of years ago issued an incredible opinion saying, indeed, the email that you store with third parties, you know, your Gmail, your Yahoo Mail, your Hotmail, is protected by the Fourth Amendment, and the government has to get a warrant to, uh, before they can acquire it. Unfortunately, well, thank you. Don't clap too soon, though. Unfortunately, the en banc Sixth Circuit, the entire uh, panel of judges of the Sixth Circuit, ended up vacating that decision on a procedural ground. But now, Mr. Warshak has been convicted, and he's appealing his criminal conviction. And so we have another bite at that apple, because he's arguing that the court should have suppressed his emails under the Fourth Amendment. And so we, once again, have thrown in uh, an amicus brief arguing that the Fourth Amendment protects the privacy of your email. And uh, we uh, just filed that uh, last month, and we're waiting uh, for a decision there and, and hoping for a good one based on the earlier decision. Um, Finally, we've continued our work on protecting the privacy of your cell phone. We'd had a lot of success uh, re getting the government to have to get a warrant before it wanted to track your cell phone in real time. We've gotten into a, a great situation where a lot of magistrate judges, when faced with government uh, applications to, to track your phone without probable cause, have come to us asking for our opinion, asking us to brief them on it. And we've had uh, several courts, based on our briefing, uh, deny the government's requests. But uh, now we've broken into a new issue, which is what does the government have to do if it wants to get stored records of the phone company about your location? Uh, and in a case that we weren't aware of at the time, a magistrate in Pennsylvania said that they needed a warrant. Uh, we jumped in and filed a brief uh, when the government appealed that to the district court. And success, the district court agreed and upheld the magistrate's decision uh, requiring the government to get a warrant before it gets your cell phone company's location records. Uh, of course, the government has appealed that now to the Sixth Circuit. Um, I'm sorry, the Third Circuit. Um, and we've briefed the circuit court, and we're once again waiting on an opinion. So uh, a few disappointing uh, um, things have happened this year, but we're continuing the fight on multiple fronts. And uh, right now, we're waiting on a bunch of opinions, and we expect several of them are going to be pretty darn good. So. And now, uh, Marsha Hoffman, talk about the, our uh, transparency efforts. Hey there, everybody. Um, DEF CON is particularly close to my heart because in 2006 we actually announced the launch of our transparency project here and um, everybody was super supportive, which I always really appreciated. Um, EFF has a project that we call the FOIA Litigation for Accountability or FLAG project. Basically what we do is um, we, excuse me? Accountable government. Oh, accountable government, sorry, sorry. Uh, basically what we do is um, we use this law that's called the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and basically, it allows anybody to make requests to the government for information about um, what the government's up to. And uh, there's a presumption that the government has to release this information unless uh, it, there's a really good, compelling reason why it shouldn't. 
like national security or it would compromise a criminal investigation or something like this. So we use this law to make requests of the government and um, you know we're, we're mostly interested in information um, showing the government's use of technology and the way that it may or may not compromise civil liberties, you know, especially in a national security or law enforcement context. And um, uh, when we get the information, we, we, we try to put it up on our website, make it available to the public. When we have trouble getting the information, we, we strategically file lawsuits um, to try to get the information released more quickly or you know, a greater amount of information released because we think that the government um, is wrongfully withholding it um, under uh, a number of exemptions. So um, since we launched the project, we filed uh, about 150 requests. Uh, we've litigated um, several lawsuits. Um, in the past year, one of the most interesting um, things in, in our little bailiwick of EFF has been seeing the way that the, the change in the presidential administration has affected um, the, the Freedom of Information Act and, and government transparency in general. Um, on his first full day in office, uh, President Obama released a memo announcing that his presidency was going to uh, be an, un, an, an unprecedented era of transparency and openness, which made us very enthusiastic um, to see that, that, that promise come to fruition. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we found through our lawsuits that began in, in the Bush era and now have, have continued through the Obama era that this has not um, worked out as well as we, we would hope. And uh, we've been a bit disappointed uh, with the government's uh, reluctance to change some of the uh, decisions uh, that it made under the Bush presidency that we, we thought uh, weren't very um, well made. Um, and to the extent that you, know, you, you want to talk about those lawsuits, I'm happy to talk about them more in the Q&A. Um, you might be interested to know about a couple of our more recent lawsuits that we filed. Um, in the past uh, couple weeks, we filed suit against a number of federal intelligence agencies, including uh, the CIA, the NSA, um, the Department of Justice, um, which has you know, underneath it the FBI, and um, some other agencies, uh, seeking um, reports that have been made to a presidential advisory committee called um, the Intelligence Oversight Board. And basically, this board is responsible for um, taking a look at intelligence activities throughout the intelligence community and reporting to the president any that uh, might be unlawful or um, you know, contrary to presidential order. And um, uh, agencies are, are responsible for sort of self-policing and reporting to this board uh, incidents that, that raise questions about legality. And so basically we're trying to get um, all of those reports across the government since 2001. And um, you know, are hoping that uh, that might give us a pretty good idea of what kind of intelligence misconduct has, has been happening during this time and, and how frequent it is. Um, another lawsuit that we filed recently um, is one in which we're seeking the FBI's internal guidelines on um, conducting investigations um, within the United States, um, particularly uh, investigations involving um, surveillance. Um, these are uh, guidelines that were released in the past several months and uh, appear to be operational, but we have no idea what those guidelines say. So that's another thing that we're seeking pretty um, aggressively. Um, in closing, I just want to say that uh, we spend a lot of time uh, trying to investigate um, and, and come up with good requests. Um, and you know, to the extent that any of you have ideas for things that we might be requesting from the federal government, I certainly would like to hear it. Thank you. Jennifer Granick, uh, Civil Liberties Director, talk about the Coders Rights Project. Thank you. So Coders Rights Project is the work that we do. It's a, so they're the umbrella name we use for the work that we do that's to help um, reverse engineers and computer security people and hackers like people at this conference. And um, I spent some time already today talking about some of the cases that we've done under the Coders Rights Project. So for those of you who came to the earlier talks, you know, our MBTA case um, is, is one of these cases involving trying to protect the rights of people to present their research at conferences. Um, and we also do a lot of work involving, um, well, let me say, so, so you know, when we talked to, when we did the MBTA case, we had talked to those researchers prior to their coming here to the conference to give their talk. And so the work we do here is, is, is both the kind of flashy and exciting thing that happens when something um, goes horribly awry and a lawsuit gets filed and you have to react really quickly and show up in court and argue about 
restraining orders and gag orders and preliminary injunctions and those sorts of things. But there's immense amount of work that we do for coders' rights that goes on behind the scenes, which involves us talking to people who have concerns about their projects ahead of time. And um, this year, maybe because of MBTA or maybe because y'all are pushing the envelope a little bit more than usual or something like that, was a particularly busy year for counseling people ahead of time. Um, we talked to, by my count, about nine different people ahead of their time of their giving their talks and finding out what they were going to talk about, how they did the research, what their concerns were, researching the relevant laws, and giving people some advice about how to um, how to how to best present their 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 work in a way that um, was going to uh, you know kind of manage the risk that something might go horribly awry, so that you know we can continue to have the kind of valuable information that is transmitted at conferences like this continue to go on. So you know I always say, and you know my colleagues sort of think it's horrible, but I always say, like, you know, why do we try so hard to help these people make nothing go wrong ahead of time? You know, it's all this, like, talking and work and stuff, and then there's no lawsuits, and we don't get to go to court and argue stuff with judges and get some opinions and everything. Um, but, you know, we, we uh, I'm always mindful, at, you know, as I said in the talk before, that while litigation is what I've chosen to spend my life doing, it's certainly not what you guys have chosen to spend your life doing, and so, you know, we do a lot of stuff behind the scenes and early on to try to make sure that you don't have to. Um, so uh, that's part of coders' rights. We also spend um, a, a not small amount of time, and I spend a lot of time worrying about the scope of the computer crime law, both at the state and federal level. And um, we do a, a number of different kinds of cases trying to litigate about the computer crime law and, and narrow its scope. Um, the li fewer things that it applies to, the, the better, um, because it, it, the law is overbroad. So the more we can do to kind of like tie it down and narrow it, the, the better it is. And actually, Marsha has a case under Coder's Rights Project that she's working on now that I'm going to ask her to talk to you about. Sure. So this case is called United States versus Sioni, and it basically involves a situation where uh, there was a woman who worked at this company. Um, she started to have an affair with her, uh, with her boss. And um, the boss was married. Uh, the woman was also married. And um, she started to uh, become suspicious that he was, you know, perhaps involved with, with other women as well. Um, you know, it started to really, really bother her. She did some things that, that um, maybe she otherwise wouldn't have done. Um, <laughs> we all find ourselves in these situations, right? Uh, <laughs> and she, she hired somebody to... Um, basically uh, get the password to um, her lover's email account and his wife's email account and um, some other people uh, with whom he, she suspected he might be involved. And um, she used those passwords to access those email accounts numerous times. And she took uh, some of the information that she got from those accounts and um, made uh, some you know, cryptic, uh, you know, perhaps threatening phone calls uh, to him and to his wife and, uh, you know, kind of suggesting that she knew he was not such a great guy, uh, using some of the details that she learned from these accounts. And she also, um, you know, printed out copies of some of these emails and, and mailed them to him and to his wife. This is what we call bad facts. Bad facts. You learn in law school, these are bad facts. Not a very sympathetic client. <laughs> um, but... Um, that's okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, the government decided to prosecute her for her behavior and um, charge uh, several violations of the law, two of which are, are very interesting to us. Um, for one thing, the government said that this woman violated the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, now, among other things, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act says that um, if you intentionally access a protected computer without authorization, uh, and thereby obtain information um, from any protected computer, um, this is a violation of the law. Um, this can be a misdemeanor or this can be a felony. Um, it's a misdemeanor if, you know, the, the person commits this uh, conduct and that's just kind of, you know, the beginning and end of the story. But if, if the person does this in order to uh, commit another crime, uh, or another bad act, then, then it's a serious, uh, a more serious violation and it, it's a felony. Um, the government also said that this woman um, committed a violation of the Stored Communications Act. Um, and basically there it's a crime uh, to intentionally access, uh, without authorization, a facility through which an electronic communication is provided. And uh, if, if, you, if you do this and by doing so you access uh, an electronic communication while in storage, then you've violated the law. 
Uh, basically, what the government was saying was that by doing the first thing and also doing the second thing, uh, the, the first offense should be elevated from a misdemeanor to a felony. So basically, she, she obtained unauthorized access, and in doing so, obtained unauthorized access to a stored communication, and so the first one is a felony. And we think this is basically double-dipping, that this woman should not be punished you know, so severely for basically what is one act. She should be punished one time and one time only. So we're um, filing a, what's known as an amicus brief or a friend of the court brief in this case. We're not actually representing this woman, but we're kind of weighing in and saying that, um, you know, in, in, in the trial court deciding to convict her of those, those two offenses and, you know, thereby elevating one from a misdemeanor to a felony was just r- really too harsh and shouldn't have been, um, it, it just shouldn't have been done. So that's the story with that case. So that's in its sort of early stages. It's interesting because it's a similar legal issue to the Sarah Palin email hacker case, yep. which Actually people might be issue, more. Yeah. So it's basically the same issue, which people might be more in, more familiar with fact pattern wise. And so here we have this situation where again the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is being read in this really broad way, where it has a lot of application, and it really does matter whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor because basically misdemeanors don't get charged really all that much at the federal level, and felonies always do. Um, so we also do a bunch of work for reverse engineers and um, for coders. Um, stuff that arises under the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA uh, and and a variety of different kinds of cases. And we're always looking for other good new cases. So if you have issues as they come up in your research or in your talk, when you're giving talks at this or at other conferences, you know, please send an email um, encrypted or <laughs> give me a call and, and let us know and we can talk about what those issues are. So thanks very much. All right. Thank you. And finally, uh, Fred Von Lohman to talk about some of the uh, legal issues, several liberty issues arising in the copyright world. Yes, so um, I've mentioned a couple of these a little bit earlier. I'll just uh, review them for those who weren't at our earlier talks. Um, In the copyright space, we continue to do a lot of work around fair use and free speech, particularly for online video. Um, There have been a lot of bogus takedowns of content on sites like YouTube. Some of you may know that Warner Music Group has suddenly decided that every video that has any song of theirs in it should automatically be blocked off YouTube. Um, So we've done a lot to sort of help explain to people how the YouTube process works, the removal process, the dispute process, the counter notice process, all of the uh, rather complicated ways you can get your videos restored if you believe you, in fact, are not infringing copyright law. And we have brought some of those uh, folks into court where uh, we've been able to sue people who send bogus takedowns. So we're going to keep doing that. Um, There are a couple of things that may be more near and dear to the hearts of some of you here. Um, We are in front of the Copyright Office right now. We get a chance once every three years to ask for exceptions to the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA, that pesky law that says you're not supposed to be bypassing technical protection measures used on copyrighted works like software and, increasingly, uh, hardware devices like your cell phone. So two of the exemptions we asked for this time around, one would be jailbreaking your phone, which increasingly means the iPhone, uh, to get the ability to run software of your choice from sources of your choice to run on the phone you own. Um, Apple has taken the position that doing uh, that, jailbreaking your iPhone, violates the DMCA because of their... Uh, sign chain of trust encryption uh, system for the firmware. Uh, We've said even if that's right, that doesn't infringe any copyright. When I use my own phone to run my own firmware on that phone to run software that I choose to run, we don't think any copyrights are infringed. We're asking the Copyright Office to come to that same conclusion and give everybody a three-year blanket exemption to allow them to jailbreak their phones. The other exemption we've asked for that's uh, near and dear, I think, to some of the folks here in this room is an exemption that actually Jennifer Granick pioneered three years ago, that she got an exemption that lets you unlock your phone, your cell phone, in order to take it to a different carrier. For the last three years, that has been uh, had an exemption um, to allow it under the DMCA. Uh, There are still some cell phone carriers who don't like that. Uh, We are uh, fighting to make sure you continue to at least not have to worry about the DMCA if you want to take a phone you own to a carrier of your choice. Um, So those are sort of two parts of our efforts to sort of underscore the you bought it, you own it part of the copyright law 
uh, which I think matters to anybody who cares about the ability to modify and adapt and basically pop the hood on the hardware and software that you own. Um, another <clears throat> case that we took a few months ago that might be of interest to some is a case involving a website called BlueWiki. Um, BlueWiki is a public wiki site, like many others that are available, free hosting for wiki-based discussions. One of the discussions there was about how to make your iPod Touch or your iPhone sync using software other than iTunes. So if folks who don't know this, in the last several versions of the iPhone and iPod Touch, Apple has added a little hash onto the database file, the iTunes DB file, that is the index file that tells your uh, iPod what's on your iPod. You know, metadata, artist, title, album, genre, all of that stuff is included in a database table. That table is in the clear, but there's a little hash that's calculated that's put with that table, and if your iPhone doesn't see a properly calculated hash, it won't load that index file which essentially means if you want to use something like Songbird or Winamp or any of a number of other open source uh, media management uh, tools, you won't be able to easily sync your media from your own computer to your uh, iPod Touch or your iPhone. So on BlueWiki, this bunch of hobbyists, bunch of hackers, started talking about what it would take to reverse engineer this. Um, they, didn't, they had just started. It was basically a dump of some decompiled uh, Apple code, really short snippet. It was basically an obfuscated memcopy function, not exactly terribly crown jewels material. Uh, and they basically said, hey, we need help. We need the following things. We're looking for volunteers who might be interested in reverse engineering this hash function. They had not succeeded. There were no tools there. They had not uh, written anything about how you would actually accomplish the goal. They were just soliciting help. Apple sent a bunch of lawyer letters to the, fo the folks who run the BlueWiki service, said hosting that discussion of reverse engineering violates the DMCA. Um, we wrote back, well, BlueWiki, the guy who runs it, called us. We took him as a client. We wrote back to Apple and said, what? Um, <clears throat> so it was the first time we'd ever heard anybody argue that simply talking about reverse engineering, not distributing a tool, not explaining how it's done, but simply saying, hey, this is a problem that might be interesting and here's how we might want to address it, uh, that that by itself violated the law. We thought that was completely bogus. We gave Apple a chance to explain why they uh, thought this. They wrote back a several page letter and we said, okay, fine, we're going to sue you. Um, so we sued Apple, um, said this is protected speech, this does not fall within the scope of the law, you've got nothing. Uh, and fortunately, I mean, it's one of these hard things, you know, we say at EFF where total victory, victory for your client is never enough. Um, Apple, a few months ago, well, a few weeks ago actually, backed down, withdrew their threat and said, uh, maybe we didn't really mean it. Um, that's of course a disappointment to me because I would have preferred to kick their ass in court get a precedent. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, good victory, uh, but I think it's not the last time that we will have to address the question, not just of is it legal to reverse engineer, but is it legal to reverse engineer in public? Because that's fundamentally what this was about, the ability to solicit and build a team to do reverse engineering in a public forum, in a public way, without worrying about lawyers uh, silencing that discussion. So uh, if it happens again, hopefully uh, uh, this time Apple won't back down and we'll beat them all the way in court. So <clears throat> thanks. Right. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, and so now, uh, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Kurt Opsahl. I'm a senior staff attorney at the EFF. I work in the civil liberties and uh, privacy free speech space, as well as on some copyright issues. Uh, but without uh, further ado, I would like to turn it over to you all for questions. We have, I believe, a live mic at the front side here on the right. Uh, so if people want to line up there for questions, or if you shout them out, I will try and translate them. All right, we'll start out with you, you sir. to be a federal interest and, and what the current state is of what 
repeat the question. The, the question is, w what kind of computers are protected by the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? So the, um, the, the statute, because a federal statute um, has to have an interstate nexus, inter connection to interstate. Uh, and so what protected computer is a term of art under the statute, which basically means a computer that's in interstate commerce. And that means a computer that's connected to the internet. It could also mean a computer where the parts have come from another state or something like that. So it's not a difficult standard to meet. Protected basically means it's enough to, to, to um, warrant federal jurisdiction. Um, it was a mildly interesting question of whether something was a protected computer when we did the MBTA case. Um, in that case, it was uh, a, the system or the computers that were involved were the Boston transit system. And in that case, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle about whether those were protected computers because they were all in Boston. And they um, had introduced a declaration into uh, the dockets showing that at least one of the Boston T stations was actually in Rhode Island. So there was an interstate nexus there. But I think they could have made that with a, with a far lesser showing than that. It, it doesn't take a lot to, to in, invoke federal jurisdiction. Do you want to say something about the discretion, why they chose to sue this woman? I don't think we really know. Yeah. Sir? Hi. Hi. I have a question regarding your work on ensuring that there's uh, probable cause required for certain kinds of surveillance. Um, if you're successful, uh, it might result in less surveillance if law enforcement goes to judges and they're turned down, or it just might result in law enforcement uh, doing the paperwork right and the same amount of surveillance actually happening. Do you have a sense for which, you know, which way it might go? Um, well, first, I, you know, I, I hate to characterize it as simply doing more paperwork. The probable cause standard is in, you know, a constitutional protection enshrined in the Fourth Amendment, and we don't think it's a, a trivial thing. That being said, there are certainly cases where the government seeks uh, surveillance authority without showing probable cause, even though they have it, either because, one, they don't want to do the paperwork, uh, or, uh, two, they want to continue to gather precedent where they've been able to get it without probable cause. Um, I do think that to the extent we were able to, for example, require probable cause before the seizure of email or require probable cause before live or historical cell phone tracking, that would result in a distinct lessening uh, of, you know, in terms of the numbers of, of these surveillances. Uh, but you do raise a good point that certainly in some cases they do have probable cause, they just don't want to bother having to show it. Hi. Uh, I've, I've become interested in the Seibel Edmonds case. Or her, uh, her, her case was uh, denied certiorari for the U.S. Supreme Court. She's a former FBI translator. Uh, I, I would, my question is, uh, does the Fourth Amendment uh, have to be uh, sacrificed uh, on the altar of uh, national security? Um, no. <laughs> Hi. So uh, my, I actually have a couple questions, and um, I'll be very impressed if you can answer it in one word. Um, so um, I'm, I've been running a Tor exit node um, for uh, over three years now. Um, cool. And well, uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been interesting. It's been a fight. Um, so I have several questions. I've obviously received a number of DMCA takedown notices, which I've responded to using your uh, template uh, letter. Um, I've also been accused of hacking a number of systems around the world, which you know I've just very politely emailed back and said, no, that's not the case. Here's what I'm doing. Um, However, um, I've had uh, now one, maybe two ISPs that have cut me off. Um, I'm on my third. So far, they've been great. Um, and I'm not going to name names. Uh, so one question I have is, um, do I have any recourse um, as far as uh, working with my ISPs? I've been straight up threatened by, by people in my ISP. Like, I, I really wish I recorded these conversations. These abuse guys are, are frankly, assholes. Um, and seriously, I'm, I apologize if... There's a nice one in the audience, but um, a nice abuse department person. 
Uh, so that's my first question. My second question is, um, am I protected under the Safe Harbor Act of the, the, the DMCA um, as, as providing, um, uh, basically, it, it, as long as I take some action uh, about a hacking complaint or whatnot, um, or could I be taken to court for that? Um, and if I am taken to court uh, for either a DMCA notice or a, uh, you know, some accusation of a hacking attempt, what do I do? Because I, I just honestly have no idea what I'd do at that point. So I'll start by saying thanks for running a Tor exit node. I am on the board of the Tor project, and uh, the Tor project was an EFF project for a spell as well. Um, my only regret is that Roger Dingledine's talk is cross uh, is going on right now, I think, so uh, otherwise I'd tell you all to be there. Um, so let me answer those questions as best I can. First, do you have recourse against your ISP if you want to run a Tor exit node? Probably not. Um, your relationship with your internet service provider is largely defined by the terms of service, that the contractual terms that came with your account. So a lot will depend on reading that fine print. Um, that being said, a lot of ISPs, the one piece of fine print that most of these agreements have is we can terminate you at any time for any reason or no reason at all, um, subject to refunding the rest of your monthly payment that month. Um, and so they don't have to have you as a customer. Uh, and if they choose not to have you as a customer, it can be very difficult to force them to keep you as a customer. So th I think you're doing exactly the right thing, which is try to talk to uh, your ISP, build a relationship, hopefully choose an ISP that knows what Tor is, um, understands why it matters, and understands why fundamentally the ISP is very unlikely to have any legal exposure based on what you're doing. Now, they may not want your business because you're running up bandwidth or whatever else, but if they say, we're afraid we're going to get sued for it, tell them to call us. I'm happy to explain why I don't think they're any more likely to get sued for what you do than what, every other, what every, any other customer of theirs is up to. They're just carrying bits. The law gives them reasonable protections, maybe not perfect, but pretty good. So the second question, will the DMCA protect you as a Tor exit node operator from copyright infringement claims that might happen because somebody's using your Tor exit node to share uh, an HBO uh, you know, series or something? Um, we think the answer ought to be yes. Um, you are effectively operating no differently than most ISPs are. You're just passing bits. You're not choosing those bits. You're not altering those bits. Um, that question has not been tested in court. Um, if you Google for the terms EFF Tor test case, um, you will find an email message that I sent out uh, a while ago explaining that we are looking for a test case. Uh, if a copyright owner wants to have that fight, I would love to have that fight. But I also have a list of what would make you a good person to be our client in that test case, explaining that if you're a major wares pirate yourself, maybe you're not the best client for that. So um, I, would, uh, I would encourage anybody who is running a Tor exit node, who's in your position, who you know, wants to think about this and is getting a lot of these complaints and wants to decide, do I want to be a test case or not, read that email. Think about whether you meet those criteria. If you do and you want help, call me. Oh, I did. So uh, Jennifer is asking me to say a few words about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Uh, the Communications Decency Act is, is probably most famous or was most famous because it was attempting to stop indecent material from being on the Internet. As it turned out, that was unconstitutional. However, another aspect of the Act, uh, Section 230, uh, provides strong protections for uh, users or providers of interactive computer services. Um, and some of its protections include a protection from state criminal law uh, claims that are based on uh, the activities of third-party users of the interactive computer service. The, the basic idea behind the law is that the soapbox is not liable for what the speaker has said. Um, it has uh, a, uh, some exemptions. For example, intellectual property is not protected by 230. That, that's uh, handled in copyright under the DMCA safe harbors. Another one is federal criminal law. So uh, the um, 
CFAA uh, and also the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, those aren't covered because those are federal laws. But state criminal laws uh, are, are um, protected against them through Section 230. Cool. Thank you. Nice sh shirt, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I have a couple of general questions. First off, I was following I was following you on the ACTA case. I think it stands for Anti Counterfeiting Trade Agreement. And I noticed that I at least I got the impression that you that you sort of backed down from that in attempting to obtain this document through the Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? Sure, no problem. Uh, one of the FOIA cases that we did in the past year um, was for documents related to uh, ACTA, or the Anti-Counterfeiting -Counter Trade Agreement, uh, which was um, an international agreement being uh, uh, negotiated between uh, a bunch of countries. It's still being negotiated. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think perhaps Fred might be in a better position to talk maybe a little bit about ACTA and what it does. Um, do you want to just say a couple sentences about uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll just say a few agreement? words. So ACTA is being currently negotiated by a lot of major, uh, you know, Western trading countries. The idea is to strengthen protections, sort of international cross-border protections for counterfeit goods. As you might imagine, there's an awful lot of copyright owners and trademark owners who are trying to basically jump into that action to use this as a way to lever up protection for movies, music, uh, more criminal penalties for people who defeat DRM. You know, all the kinds of things you would imagine they would try to sneak into this document as far as we can tell, they are, but the negotiations are secret, the drafts of the documents are secret, um, all of this is going on behind closed doors and is being done by our government nominally in our name, uh, and so part of what we were interested in here is getting copies of some of the drafts and getting some transparency in on the process. So right. that's where the so, so Marsha we, comes in. So that's where I come in. Um, we worked with our international team. Uh, to craft a FOIA request, and um, we got a few documents that uh, we didn't find terribly interesting, and a lot of the material was withheld because um, the government said it was it was classified. Um, under uh, an executive order, uh, one of the reasons why information might be classified is because it pertains to um, you know foreign negotiations, foreign government information, and um, as a consequence, the government says that um, it implicates national security. And um, in that situation, that information can be properly classified. And um, in, uh, not surprisingly, under the FOIA, classified information is exempt from disclosure. And it's um, extremely difficult to, to challenge that in a court of law and get a judge to second guess the government's decision that something ought to be classified and get you know, a judge to actually say, you know what, never mind, you should release that. So we assessed our chances of success in that case, and we thought it was extremely unlikely that we were going to get a judge to unclassify it. And so that's why we decided not to, not to continue to challenge um, that decision by the government. Yeah, we, I will say we are continuing to fight on the ACTA front. Mm -hmm. And in fact, ironically, we have found more cooperative transparency from our trading partners in other countries than we have from our own government. So that, that fight's not over. And we continue to talk to people in the State Department. Um, you know, they, they have wanted to talk about uh, questions raised by, uh, you know, by this case and by other questions about the ACTA process and its lack of transparency. And, you know, they're, we are engaging them. They are engaging us in further discussions about, you know, transparency around that, that process. We just made the decision that in, in the FOIA context, we weren't likely to, to get much more than we already had and that our resources were better, better put elsewhere. It was my understanding that it, that this was supposed to be passed on very short notice. The um, treaty? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, in sort of in sort of a synchrony between the between the countries. Mm -hmm. um, it, what does the EFF plan to do, if anything, in response to this? Because uh, it's my understanding that it's also intended to be passed uh, relatively undemocratically by the pre by the president's signature alone. Yeah. I, we again we continue to be uh, working on that both through our own. Uh, U.S. Trade Rep and the other negotiators here, as well as with other 
parties to the agreement who are negotiating, you know, parties in other countries that are negotiating as well. Um, my, uh, my sense is that it's not imminent at this point. Um, I think we have had success in getting uh, people to slow this thing down and ask questions, uh, including, uh, as Marsha points out, even within the Obama administration, some reconsideration may be underway of at least a degree of transparency. So it's not over. It doesn't appear likely that it's, uh, that ACTA is going to happen anytime real soon. Um, but, of course, it could move quickly. So the idea is we're, we're staying on it and uh, hopefully we'll keep people apprised. Given that they plan that this that this agreement is planned to be passed by the president's signature alone, can and can communicating issues about this agreement with congressmen have any impact? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, Congress certainly has input here. Um, treaties are generally ratified by advice and consent of the Senate. I believe that would be true for this one as well. And, for, and more importantly, quite frankly, if the members of Congress who run the, the trade portfolio uh, have an interest here, they're going to be heard by the U.S. trade rep. They're going to be heard by U.S. Uh, negotiators. So uh, I think there is still some room for improvement even with, uh, uh, with, within our own government on this. You said that this has to be ratified by, the, by Congress. Correct. Um, but I think advice and consent of the Senate is all that's required. I'm not positive on that score. Um, and I, again, the person who runs the ACTA portfolio for us is my colleague Gwen Hins, um, who runs our international team and is, um, I'm sure, somebody who would be happy to uh, answer more questions if you want to ping her directly. Okay. My second question, which is very, which is rather. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I wrote mine down. Um, does the fact that the use of the state secret privilege in the U.S., the case the U.S. versus Reynolds, uh, that it was based on lies and just protect, like, the Air Force Command, does that, like, come up at all in, in your experience? And if so, like, what's, do you have any anecdotes or anything like that? Because it kind of boggles my mind how the state secret is so, you know, wonderful privilege, but it's all based on, well, the precedent was based on, you know, protecting a couple officers' ass. Uh, so uh, the question is about the, the United States versus uh, Reynolds case, a case that came before the Supreme Court in the 1950s uh, during the uh, McCarthy era, um, and it concerned a, uh, a lawsuit uh, over uh, a plane crash, a government plane crash, Air Force uh, uh, plane, and uh, the... Uh, uh, um, Errors of people who died in that crash felt that the government may have been negligent in its uh, in its duties uh, with respect to the plane. And then when they sued over this, the government said, no, 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 you can't go ahead with your suit because this will reveal state secrets, that there's classified information uh, about this uh, super secret experimental plane, and so it will endanger national security if this suit is allowed to proceed. And this went all the way up to the Supreme Court, uh, and the Supreme Court decided the case and, and created the precedent behind what is known as the state secret privilege, which allows, in some circumstance, the government to dismiss a case uh, based on concerns about national security. And the Supreme Court and none of the courts below that, ever, none of them ever looked at the evidence. Uh, years and years later, that evidence was eventually declassified. Uh, and it turned out that uh, there was no national security nexus. Uh, the, the information that they were hiding was that they were, in fact, negligent uh, and that the experimental uh, national security-related aspects of this plane had nothing to do with the crash, were nowhere, were nowhere near that. Uh, and so uh, thus, uh, it was revealed that the basis of the state secret privilege was, in fact, the government using that privilege to hide their own negligence and deceiving the court about the national security implications. Um, as it turns out, that nevertheless, uh, the state secret privilege uh, and Reynolds, Reynolds is still good law and the state secret privilege remains alive. The uh, family uh, of Reynolds and, and others who died in that crash actually tried to reopen the case, uh, saying that there had been a fraud upon the court and it should be uh, reconsidered, uh, but that effort was, uh, was unsuccessful. 
Um, and, you know, it, it certainly is mentioned uh, when, when the Reynolds case comes up. You know, we certainly like to remind the court that it was, it was based on this. And, you know, one of the arguments, the policy arguments at least, uh, behind the, uh, the state secret privilege is completely undermined by this because, you know, those, those who are opposed to it are saying that's exactly why you shouldn't have a unilateral state secret privilege that gives this much uh, power uh, to the federal government. Uh, and one of the things that we've been litigating um, in the context of our NSA surveillance uh, litigation is whether or not the state secrets privilege um, requires the court to dismiss the suit. Uh, in the context of our suit against the telecoms, uh, the judge agreed that the state secret privilege did not require dismissal of the lawsuit, so we succeeded there. Uh, and then uh, the government went to Congress and got telecom immunity passed. Uh, which was which was very flattering, uh, but it didn't help uh, keep the, the case going. Though we are appealing the the telecom immunity uh, issue, uh, and the government raised it again in our suit against uh, the government, uh, uh, Jewel versus NSA, um, and in there, that case we are uh, arguing with the government whether. The case should be dismissed under state secret privilege. We are hopeful f to uh, push forward there by pointing out to the court that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act superseded the state secret privilege and provided a means by which a court can determine whether surveillance is legal uh, in, in, under appropriate security measures that will both protect the national security interests and allow a court to have uh, a ruling on the merits. Uh, my question slash opinion is, or trying to get your opinion is um, related to uh, in UK there was a company or a person not exactly sure all the information but um, they would basically go out and find out the information and specs of an Apple computer and basically buy the same parts of an Apple computer for a third of the price and actually install Apple onto you know go out and purchase the CD to install Apple and then actually sell that computer to somebody and well, I heard that they got sued for um, Apple came in and sued that company or person for basically um, rem the re the person was selling the computers for a third of the cost, and Apple came in and said that the um, that they basically wanted their money back, and they the guy got sued for the remainder of the cost, but the difference between him the third and the actual regular price. And I want to know what your opinion was on it and whether they're actually allowed to do that. So I'm not familiar with the UK case you mentioned, but this is an issue that has come up uh, repeatedly. Is there any, how many people in the audience run a Hackintosh at home? A few, few, good for you, good for you. So um, the running OS X on a generic Windows box, generally known as a Hackintosh, um, is something that, you know, is not terribly hard to do, pretty well documented online. There are a few companies that have gone uh, to the trouble of actually selling pre-built Hackintoshes. Psystar gets probably the most press here in the U.S. about it. They have been sued by Apple uh, for doing so. Apple has a number of very interesting legal theories, many of which I think are bogus. Um, the key ones are, one, they say it violates the terms of, you know, the, the end-user license agreement that comes with OS X. Um, I think Psystar plausibly, you know, Psystar plausibly responds by saying, we don't install the software. We never click I agree. All we do is provide hardware with a retail shrink-wrapped boxed copy of OS X. So how is it that we violated a license? Um, the other argument Apple has is that they have technical protection measures built into OS X that's designed to prevent it from loading on any uh, system other than an actual Apple ROMed piece of hardware. Um, I am not uh, in a position to sort of know what the technical merits of that argument are. Psystar certainly disputes that that's true. The bad news for Psystar is Apple is a big company with a lot of lawyers. Psystar is a small company, and they've essentially been driven into bankruptcy by the cost of the litigation. Um, and they did just find themselves a new set of lawyers to continue the defense. Um, but whether or not they're going to prevail in the, uh, at the end of the day is uh, sort of hard to know uh, based on whether or not they'll have the amount of money it would take to actually keep up the fight. Um, I'm not aware of Apple going after any individuals who whip up their own Hackintoshes. I'm also not aware of Apple targeting any of the sites where these activities are discussed. Um, if either of those things happen, then uh, I hope somebody will call. Wow, this is really awkward. Um, 
Recently, we've seen uh, in the news uh, this problem with. Uh, I don't think I'll go up any further because of the cord. Uh, oh, hey! Hurrah! <laughs> How many engineers does it take to raise a mic stand? Um, we we've seen in the news recently this this whole kerfuffle with um, Amazon's Kindle, and which made people really question content ownership as well as what the hell can this device actually do with the stuff I bought? And just, I think, a week or two ago, we saw Barnes & Noble release a, an e-reader that decided to wrap six public domain works in some rather onerous DRM. So I actually have two questions. First is, what rights and risks do users have in dealing with the DRM on these works that they've paid for? And the second is, do you see some sort of battle brewing that's going to clarify in the near future uh, exactly what the publishers and the sellers of these devices can do with respect to that content? So that's a really good set of questions. We are unfortunately moving from a world of owning stuff to a world of having service agreements with vendors uh, in 10,000 words or more of legalese describing what our rights may or may not be. Um, and Kindle's automated uh, remote deletion of George Orwell's Animal Farm in 1984 off of Kindle's certainly kind of underscored that in a delightfully uh, <clears throat> interesting way. Uh, for anybody who hasn't heard, uh, Amazon has been sued now in a plaintiff side class action lawsuit for that. Um, that uh, news just came out a few days ago. Um, it's interesting because Amazon's own terms of service promise that you will have permanent access to books that you buy, uh, a piece of legal drafting that I imagine somebody is being yelled at for as we speak. Um, <clears throat> always good if the lawyers actually talk to the engineers before they write stupid things in their service agreements. Um, you can be uh, pretty assured that Amazon will either amend that or uh, future folks won't be foolish enough to put that kind of language in. Um, so in terms of the big battles coming, I, I think we're going to see them. Uh, I think it's still a little early. There are actually relatively few devices right now that I'm aware of that are tethered such that vendors can automatically rewrite the code and content remotely without asking your permission. I can think of TiVo. I can think of Kindle. I can think of most uh, DVRs you get from your cable company. Um, but so even the iPhone asks you before they do an update. Um, apparently, there is some confirmation that the, uh, Steve Jobs has the power to remotely disable and remove apps on your iPhone. Not entirely clear whether they'd have the nerve to use it. Um, we'll see. Um, but as we move to a world of tethered devices like this, this is going to be a bigger and bigger question. Rather than being resolved on the basis of do you own that content, it's more likely to be resolved on the basis of what does the service agreement say about this. Um, if it's fully disclosed and you, quote unquote, knew when you bought it uh, that this was possible, I worry that courts will let folks get away with this. Um, which is probably a good reason for people to pay attention in advance and choose the products they buy based on whether or not they want this kind of remote tether to be involved. Obviously, there are other ebook readers out there that do not have uh, this quote unquote feature uh, of uh, Amazon's ability to come in and change not only the code, the, the operating system, but also delete content that you may or may not have purchased on that. So, but yes, it's going to be a big issue. Um, it's only going to get worse as more devices get more tethered. This is a rather general, uh, rather general question about a specific class of issue that hasn't applied to me personally, but I've watched it happen several times. Um, for those who don't know, critics who protest against the Church of Scientology generally have to wear masks at these, at these protest sites because the Church of Scientology is known to videotape and photograph its critics, harass and stalk and harass them and their family members. So some of these protests that have been video recorded by the, by the person, in some cases, the person who has videotaped these, these protests have uploaded them to their own YouTube accounts. So what the Church of Scientology has started respond, responding to that with is to file a DMCA takedown notice because in order to file a counter notice, you must reveal your identity to them. What, re, what recourse would you suggest for a victim of such a bogus DMCA takedown notice? 
If you, re if you do not follow through, your YouTube account is generally banned, and you, by YouTube's terms of service, you are prohibited from creating a second one. Uh, so uh, the, the, there are a lot of issues surrounding the misuse of DMCA takedown notices. Uh, in order to do a proper takedown notice, one must uh, uh, say under penalty of perjury that the material uh, is infringing. Uh, and so if, if, it, if it is material that, it is, uh, that the sender of a takedown notice does not own a copyright in, then clearly it is not infringing their rights, uh, and it would be in that circumstance an uh, improper takedown notice. Uh, but there is an interesting feature about the DMCA is that the, the process under a DMCA is to file a counter notice, um, and at that point the material can get uh, placed back uh, on the original server. But uh, in, the, in the course of the counter notice, uh, you are required to provide a certain amount of uh, information. Um, one thing you can, you can do is if you have uh, counsel is to use the uh, uh, contact information of your, of your counsel uh, as, as part of the counter notice, uh, so that that gives the uh, you know fulfills the function of the DMCA counter notice, a way that you may be contacted, uh, but without directly revealing uh, the information. And in some circumstances, it may be uh, worthwhile to consider a uh, the 512F misuse provisions. This is one of the things that uh, EFF uh, has been involved in a variety of contexts, uh, but uh, certainly surrounding YouTube. Uh, where it's come up a lot, is filing uh, lawsuits for the misuse of the DMCA notice process. Uh, we have one uh, ongoing uh, right now uh, involving uh, a takedown by Universal Music uh, of a, uh, a home video featuring a, a dancing baby uh, where a print song is playing in the background. Uh, and we're trying to take that case through the courts, and hopefully as a result of that case we'll get some uh, favorable rulings that will clarify the, role, the law around DMCA misuse and uh, make that a more effective provision uh, in the future. Suppose you do not have legal counsel or cannot afford it. Well, one thing to do if you uh, don't have legal counsel and cannot afford it is to contact the Electronic Frontier Foundation. <laughs> for, this specific, the, the, for this specific scenario? Sorry? For this specific scenario? Um, well, if we aren't able to uh, uh, help, we probably can't take on at this point another DMCA misuse case. Uh, until at least you know we, we get the ones that we currently have um, uh, to a conclusion. There's only so many we can we have the bandwidth to do at any given time. Uh, but uh, something very important to know about our uh, legal help uh, uh, services is that when we can't uh, help someone, when we don't have the bandwidth ourselves, we do make an effort to try and find uh, counsel who can help, put those people in touch, and see what we can do to to uh, help someone find the right counsel. Hi. Computer uh, Fraud and Abuse Act, as far as it applied to the Lori Drew case, the MySpace, uh, do you think that was a good or applicable use of the law? And if not, is there one, and, or should she have been charged? Are your comments on that? Um, okay, so I think that uh, the, so, so for people who are not that familiar with it, there was a case where um, a, a prosecutor out of Los Angeles charged the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for uh, against a Missouri housewife who had provided false information to MySpace by uh, giving information that uh, purported to be of a teenage boy. And the case was really because the circumstances of the, of the situation were really tragic. This account had been used by um, various people to communicate with a teenage girl and her, uh, hurtful things were said and the teenage girl killed herself. So I think that this was a misuse of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act um, and that terms of service violations cannot be violations of, of criminal law. Um, there was not a um, Missouri law that prohibited what had happened, so it wasn't against the law. It was one of these tragic situations where something terrible happens, but there's not a law that applies to it. And often, as, as a result, a lot of really bad laws get passed. And Missouri has passed a um, harassment law in response to this case, and I haven't studied it, so I don't know if I think that law is particularly overbroad or not, but, but very often these sorts of things result in, you know, kind of like, let's pass a law to deal with this situation, and it ends up having impact in a lot of other situations. I think another aspect of your question was, is the, are there any good uses of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? And um, 
uh, I think that there probably are some, um, but I think that the statute needs a dramatic amendment to narrow it quite a bit to make it clear that we're talking about um, circumvention of uh, security measures or destruction of evidence or bringing whole computer systems down, and we're not talking about these kind of you know, terms of service or lack of authorization because there's no agency relationship type of cases. Um, I was wondering what the current status was of the search and uh, replication of uh, American citizens' computers re-entering the U.S. and whether the Freedom of Information Act has changed uh, under the Obama administration. Anything's changed, or did we ever actually get any good information from them about why they're doing it? Okay, so um, your question has to do with uh, searches of laptops at the border. Um, for those who haven't followed this issue um, in the past um, year, year and a half, there's been a lot of discussion about um, uh, the government's authority to, uh, to search laptops of travelers crossing the U.S. border. Um, a lot of this was prompted by a case in uh, California in the Ninth Circuit called United States versus Arnold, um, in which um, a, a, a district court in California ruled um, for the first time that um, some level of suspicion was needed before the U.S. government could, could search a laptop in that sort of situation. Um, as a general matter, uh, the Fourth Amendment does not uh, provide the same protections at the border as it, as it does in places within the country because the thinking is that the government has a, a compelling interest in, you know, enforcing uh, customs laws and, you know, uh, so you know this, the same protections don't apply. Um, so, in in the past, you know the government's been pretty you know well in the past and now the government is pretty free and open to you know search people's luggage and what have you. And um, you know laptops obviously present um, an interesting situation because there's so much information uh, on laptops. Um, you know certainly a, a laptop is um, you know capable of, uh, of of containing a lot more data, a lot more information than you know you'd find in say a briefcase. Or, um, or luggage. And so um, the court in California held basically for the first time in, in looking at, at this type of situation. It departed with other courts and basically said, look, you know, a, a computer's different. You need at least reasonable suspicion. And then um, that decision was overturned. And um, basically the situation we're in now is uh, the, the Supreme Court considered where, whether to look at that um, or not and decided not to. And so um, at this point, the case precedent is uniformly not good. Um, the government, um, according to the courts, the government does not need any level of suspicion to search your laptop at the border. Um, we did a FOIA case trying to get information about whether um, uh, well, we, we wanted to get the government's policies and procedures, you know, sort of the internal working papers um, about how these uh, searches ought to be conducted by agents at the border. and. Um, we, uh, we filed suit. We ended up getting several hundred uh, pages of information um, detailing, uh, you know, how uh, agents are instructed to do these searches, uh, which we've put on our website and you can look at. Um, also, uh, in response to, uh, you know, the public scrutiny on this issue, um, the Department of Homeland Security actually changed its policies and procedures about a year ago and, and posted the new policy on its website, which you can look at now. Um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty problematic. From our perspective, um, you know, basically they can search at will, and they basically say they also can take your computer and, um, uh, you know, take it off site uh, to uh, perform a search, and they can keep it for a reasonable period of time. And um, you know, it's very, it's unclear what that is. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's it's entirely unclear to us from the government's perspective how long they think they can, you know, hold your computer, um, you know, under the Fourth Amendment without causing any sorts of constitutional problems. And, um, you know, this is something that we continue to look at and are trying to document the government's practices. And um, so that's kind of the status of the situation now. Meanwhile, encrypt. Meanwhile, encrypt. <laughs> Says Fred von Lohmann. <laughs> We've had several issues on privacy, and I know you guys are fighting the fight on privacy in court, but that's kind of like the back end of the situation. And I'm wondering if it's the time with the Congress changing and with political times changing and all the secondary use things now hitting in you know, the news media, is it time to have a privacy law that actually details and clears some of this up 
And if so, how would we craft that as opposed to letting the music industry craft us a privacy law? Um, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure what, what exactly you're asking. I mean, we are, we are primarily a litigation-oriented organization. We tried our hand at being an inside-the-beltway organization way back in the early 90s and decided that that uh, entailed a, a level of compromise that we weren't very comfortable with. And uh, we returned to the Beltway last year uh, due to the uh, uh, push for immunity for the telcos. Um, and uh, we fought that fight as best we could, but in many ways it reminded us of why we are not an inside the Beltway organization and would prefer to press for people's rights in court. And to the extent that uh, privacy laws are inadequate, for example, under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, that we would seek to have courts uh, enforce those rights. Uh, that being said, uh, we are involved in a uh, effort uh, involving a coalition of civil liberties organizations uh, and uh, ISP and other internet service uh, uh, organiza- service uh, companies to come up with proposals for reform of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, uh, which is the primary privacy law regarding uh, the privacy of your internet and uh, telephone conduct. Um, I'm not certain if that answers your question, however. I no, no it's, I'm not asking you to, you know, like, sell your soul and become a policy person as opposed <laughs> to who else to ask but the people that are defending our rights on privacy on what would a good blanket privacy type law look like. The Fourth Amendment is pretty short and pretty plain, but evidently doesn't mean much either at times. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious as to what a statute, you know, from your guys' expert opinion, how could you clean something up? And ma- I don't care if it's politically palatable or not. Yeah. Um, so uh, as an initial matter, actually, the Fourth Amendment, while uh, uh, it, it sometimes does not work as well as you might hope, it actually is a really great thing. And uh, it has been enormously helpful to have something which trumps laws so that you can say that that even if this law explicitly and purposefully is uh, trying to uh, invade upon your rights, that that law is still trumped by the Fourth Amendment and and the the traditions that that were handed down since our our founding fathers. So the Fourth Amendment, uh, uh, it is a, a very powerful thing, and it's something we find very useful in our litigation. Um, one, if you wanted an example of what a good privacy law is, and actually uh, I wanted to give the example of the Video Privacy Protection Act. The Video Privacy Protection Act uh, is the strongest privacy protection that you have under the law. So uh, uh, m- more, more protection for what videos you watch than there is for your financial data or your social security number or your health information. Uh, and this came about because uh, uh, Judge Bork uh, was nominated for the Supreme Court, and in the process of that uh, nomination, an enterprising reporter went to a video store and got the records of what Judge Bork had rented at the video store and then wrote a story about it. Now, as it turned out, Judge Bork did not, in fact, rent anything particularly scandalous, uh, uh, westerns, I believe, and, uh, but it made Congress think, this could happen to me. And perhaps they had rented something, something else. Um, and so uh, uh, shortly thereafter, there was broad uh, bipartisan consensus that we needed really, really strong laws to protect the privacy of what videos you watch. And they came up with, with a, uh, you know, you have to, the government has to show that it has a really important reason. It couldn't get this information from other sources. It has to give you an opportunity to contest it. It is just a a very, very powerful uh, law. So if we could expand the video privacy protections to areas outside of video, that would be a wonderful thing. Have you guys handled any cases involving software patents lately that you'd like to summarize for us? And what kind of developments do you see in software patents in the future? So that's a very good question. Um, As some people may know, the Supreme Court is hearing a case that touches on, potentially on this question, both the question of business method patents and potentially, sort of by extension, the breadth of software patents. The case is Enri Bilski. Um, We are going to be filing an amicus brief in that case. Um, Our patent busting project continues. We about, gosh, I think it was about five years ago now, chose 10 patents that we thought were 
uh, bogus when issued and which were also currently at the time being used to shake down small businesses and uh, other uh, folks who generally couldn't afford to protect themselves uh, from patent trolls. And uh, we have done a pretty good job busting those patents. I forget where we are now. Thank you. Um, Two left. That's right. I think we've gotten uh, eight of them into re-exam, two that are still left. Uh, Not all of them are software patents, but many of them are. Um, Now, I will say the trouble with software patents is the incredible expense of defending actual software litigation, uh, which is why being a patent troll continues to be a viable business, unfortunately. So um, we are doing what we can. Uh, Congress is considering patent reform legislation that might help, uh, but that process has been stuck in political wrangling for a number of years, and nobody... Last I heard, no one thinks that's going to change this year. Uh, may hap- something may happen next. Um, so we are on that. Uh, we're doing what we can. I wish we could do more. Uh, but, you know, uh, without taking on multi-million dollar patent litigation on a regular basis, uh, it's hard to bust patents one at a time when there are so many bad software patents out there. All right, we're going to take uh, a few more questions. So hopefully... Uh We'll get you out of here pretty soon, so um, we'll just take the people who are currently in line and then wrap it up, and then we're going to be around for the rest of the weekend if people want to come up to us individually with, with uh, further questions. Go ahead, sir. There have been a couple of mentions um, of both the legal status of shrink wrap license agreements and of terms of service, and I'm wondering if there have been any other cases um, targeting those, and particularly the effect of states that have passed the UCITA. I know Virginia and I think Maryland, maybe some others. Um, So yes, um, there have been a number of very interesting cases involving terms of service, end user license agreement type things. Um, The quick overview of the state of the law right now is that U.S. courts generally will find those kinds of contracts to be enforceable as a general matter if you were presented with them before you laid your money down and if you actually had to make an affirmative uh, click I agree or other uh, sign of assent. Uh, So courts have been skeptical of so-called browse wrap agreements. Those are the link at the bottom of the web page that says by visiting this web page you hereby agree to give away your firstborn. Um, Those have generally, there have been a few that actually have been upheld, but generally courts seem to think that's bogus. Um, But if you actually, they give you the splash screen, they show you the whole thing, you clicked I agree, um, and before you had to pay for the product or, you know, if you had an opportunity to get a refund, courts seem to generally find those to be enforceable contracts. So the main event in court today is assuming the contract is generally enforceable, what about particular terms? Just because the contract as a whole may be an enfor- a, a deal, an enforceable deal, doesn't mean every term necessarily will be uh, respected. And so what we're seeing is kind of term-by-term term fights in courts. The terms that are attacked most often are mandatory arbitration clauses. Um, they're frequently thrown out by courts um, who say that, you know, for example, AT&T in their uh, AT&T wireless, your cell phone, they have had their uh, uh, arbitration clause struck down several times in a row in California. Um, So that's sort of where the fight arises. And of course, for this audience, one big question is, what about the bans on reverse engineering? Um, There have been a couple of bad cases in the last five years uh, on that score. Um, It's not a done deal. I think there's still room to argue that those kinds of clauses should not be enforced. Um, There's some other bad clauses out there. I hear that in the Apple app developer agreements, you actually, one of the clauses is you agree never to criticize Apple. Um, That's a clause I would love to see in court. I think a court would probably say that's not enforceable. Um, So it really is a fight about which terms are reasonable. The general overall approach is that uh, these licenses are respected. You mentioned briefly the question of the states that have passed UCEDA. UCEDA, for those that's kind of old, kind of relatively old news now, was an effort that a lot of people felt was captured by folks like Adobe and Microsoft to make a model law that was very pro-licensor, in other words, pro-vendor, anti-consumer. Um, only two states enacted that 
Um, it's basically a dead letter now. In fact, sev- more I think three or four states have enacted provisions saying if someone tries to put UCEDA into a contract against a citizen of our state, we will render that null and void. Um, so I think UCEDA is pretty much a dead letter for the most part. That's good news. The bad news is vendors continue to put ridiculous things in these agreements and you know, it's sort of a case-by-case fight to see if you can resist them. We are, however, always looking for a good test case on that. And just a, a quick aside, uh, Judge uh, Sotomayor, who's currently up for the Supreme Court, actually wrote one of the uh, uh, important and good decisions about uh, online licensing uh, agreements. Respect, right? Respect case, yeah. yeah. That was, that's the leading case saying browse wraps are bullshit. <laughs> okay. You have had a new administration for six months now. What has noticeably changed and what noticeably has not changed? Um, so yeah, um, they the Obama administration uh, when they got into office, they they did say uh, a number of really um, great things uh, in terms of uh, promoting uh, transparency in in government, uh, and uh, uh, these these gave us some great hope uh, hope for change. <laughs> Uh, however, uh, we began to notice after a while in some of our cases that the briefs uh, did not have much change. In fact, uh, uh, they were adopting a lot of the same uh, legal arguments that had been uh, uh, pioneered by the Bush administration. Uh, this has been taking place in our warrantless wiretapping case, uh, in their views about the secret privilege, and some of their views about uh, our FOIA litigation and what things should not be uh, revealed to the public. And so in terms of uh, briefs actually filed uh, with the court, we have not seen uh, much change with the, uh, the new administration, and that has been disappointing. Uh. To, uh, the American public uh, dodged a bullet in the last uh, session of Congress. There was a bill that got uh, uh, House Resolution 1955 got uh, uh, 406 votes in, in the last Congress, and it went to uh, uh, Senator Lieberman's uh, Homeland Security Committee. Uh, President Obama was on that committee at the time. But if, if you folks know about uh, House Resolution 1955, that was the Homegrown Terrorism Act that was going to bring us back to the Joe McCarthy Rides Again era and Hollywood blacklists. But um, Jane Harmon won't talk to me, and uh, I was just wondering, is that uh, bill, uh, is, it, is it being re- reintroduced, if you know about that bill, in the next session of Congress? The Homegrown Terrorism Act. Um, I, I'm not uh, uh, familiar with this bill, and uh, you know we're, we're primarily a litigation, uh, as Kevin was saying earlier, primarily litigation-oriented uh, organization, not so much a, a lobbying. From time to time, we have weighed in on bills like the Telecom Immunity Bill, of course, which was very important to a case that we were doing, um, and so you know we have some glancing relationships uh, with with bills. Um, but I'm not in particular familiar with that one. Uh, Jane Harmon uh, we are familiar with uh, because of some of her activities uh, with respect to warrantless wiretapping. She was uh, one of the uh, first and most uh, vocal Democratic uh, proponents of warrantless wiretapping uh, when the the NSA program was first revealed in December of 2005. Uh, but then, uh, more recently, it, uh, she discovered that the government had actually been wiretapping her and uh, uh, changed her tune about that and actually then was saying that was really unfair um, for the government to have those sweeping powers. Are you guys available to come over here for the uh, question and answer session in 103, or do you want to cut all your questions off here? I okay. think we're going to end here. All right, I've got one more gentleman here that wanted to ask a question. I want to ask a quick one, and then we'll. Great. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Just a quick one. Uh, last year, I really applauded the kids from Boston and their attack. I work for the transit agency in San Francisco, and uh, <laughs> we just got to see, you know, the uh, the one about the parking meters. Which, yeah, I always wondered, you know, how long it was going to take for someone to do something. 
Uh, so I've talked to Joe Grant, and he had not yet uh, uh, been in contact with our agency, so I've been trying all day to get people to uh, take their heads out from under their wings and wake up. Um, so I'm going to try and be a proponent of, of this because I think it only makes us stronger and you know, more secure. But uh, what recommendations uh, do you have for you know, being supportive but uh, ducking the oncoming fire that may come as a result? Um, well, first, I, I want to thank you for you know being there to be interested in the talk and to um, be a conduit for the information to the Transit Authority. I know that they wanted to talk to Muni about the um, problems that they found with the parking meters, and I think that um, you know in my experience, and this is a role that you could really play that would be really awesome and helpful. In my experience, it's really engineers talking to engineers that helps to get things fixed and get things done. A lot of times, it's the policy people and the press people who are worried about all sorts of other considerations other than, you know, trying to make things work that really kind of muck up the works a lot. So um, what I'll just say to you is, you know, you're, you know, sort of serving a role and saying this is legitimate stuff. We kind of knew about this. We should have been worried about this now that, you know, we know we're going to do it. And also, you know, kind of stressing the kind of responsibility about how this is the way that information is communicated and this is the way that engineers talk to each other and that sort of thing. And then more what I'm going to say is a question back to you. You let me know you know, what we can do to help make this kind of process go smoother so we can all learn from the experience of, you know, what, what Muni's going to do with this parking meter incident. And uh, I'll give you my card, and let's keep in touch. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, no, thank you. Well, our next session is going to be uh, with the, the federal folks, where you can ask a Fed a question. We have approximately 20 of those guys, ladies, coming in here. One of the things that uh, some of us around here have noticed is you guys don't always get along, per se. I get along great with the feds. <laughs> yeah. But when we talk about they EFF, it's always excitement. We talk about feds, it's like, eh. So my question would be, just very quickly, is they're out there trying to do their job. You guys are doing your job. Do you see your role or one of your roles, perhaps, to act as that counterbalance to try to pull some of the things that they want to do back to a more reasonable level? Um, is, that, is that really kind of where you see it going? Or do you, in some cases, just want to eliminate you know, all their ability to do things. I mean, they're trying to protect us, to be fair, and, and you're trying to protect us. And I, I guess that would be the final question. There's, where do you see your role, maybe just even individually, uh, what you, th you kind of perceive that to be? Um, well, I'll sort of start with this. I, you know, I guess one thing I'd say is that you have a lot less to worry about from the feds who come here to Black Hat and DEF CON than you do from a lot of the other feds who are out there. Um, so that's thing number one that I would say. Thing number two that I would say is that um, as a whole, I think that the military and intelligence people are a little bit different from the law enforcement people, in my experience. And these are the people have very different sort of interests. Um, between military and, and intelligence and, and law enforcement. And um, in, 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 uh, I think that uh, the government is filled with civil libertarians. Um, and they are, it's filled with people who, who go into government because they're patriots. And they're patriots because, for the same reason that I'm a patriot, which is that they believe in the United States and they believe in the way that, that we do things. Um, and then there's a lot of other people out there who are not. Um, and people who get sort of wrapped up in what their job is and their mission is and become kind of focused on, we convict criminals as opposed to, you know, we enforce the law or something more along those lines. So um, to some extent, I feel like our job is to encourage the people who um, are civil libertarians in their work inside the government and to be a counterforce to the people who are not the civil libertarians. Um, and then I think also our job is to help inform you guys about what it is that the government's doing so that they can live up to their, um, up to their promises to protect our privacy and to, you know, keep us safe at the same time. And, uh, you know, I think that um, we have to be very uh, serious about making sure that, you know, and of course we respect civil liberties becomes something more than just a tag phrase that means that um, we're going to just leave everything on the floor. Uh, there are a lot of people here who I have talked with, who I'm friendly with, um, who are, work in the government and who, who do take that responsibility seriously and a lot who don't. So hopefully those of you who are staying for the Ask the Fed panel later on today will give them hell. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming.